To place a school in historical perspective, when I came to Holt five years ago, uh, we had one degree program, one academic center, 65 students, and 29 faculty members. Now, five years later, the school has seven degree programs, five academic centers, 1,900 students, and 120 faculty members. In terms of student numbers, Holt is currently the seventh largest business school in the world. Next year, it will be among the top three. Um, the Financial Times has ranked Holt number one for international experience, number five for international business education, and the Economist Intelligence Unit has ranked the school 17th in Europe, 27th in the, in the United States. We are accredited by the New England Association of Schools and Colleges, and by AMBA, we are considering seriously Equus. And we are transitioning from a part-time to a full-time faculty model with emphasis on applied business and professional development. Let me talk about the globalization of business education. Going global requires capital, a market orientation, sales capability, operational agility, and an ability to execute quickly. Some, what I call traditional business schools, cannot meet the challenge because of limited resources, a, an overly inward focus. Many schools are, are focused in, on their internal operations. Programs are designed in terms of what faculty want to teach and not necessarily what students want to take. There's an aversion to commercialization. The term sales is anathema to some academics. Slow-moving bureaucracy, cumbersome rules, regulations, and procedures. Well, question, can commercial schools succeed where some traditional schools have failed? Indeed, they can tap capital markets. They can develop a foreign market expertise. They can build an effective sales force, operate through cross-functional teams, and execute quickly. In a sense, why don't business schools apply to their own business what they teach in the classroom? Why don't they practice what they preach? The ascendancy of the commercial schools, however, poses challenges in terms of academic oversight, integrity, freedom, and scholarship. In this presentation, I'd like to focus on some of these challenges. And the, these views are personal. They're based upon my own research. They are, not they are not reflective of how we operate, but they do point out the pitfalls of some of the for-profit institutions. I proceed on the premise that commercializing business education can be an effective way to deliver educational services to individuals in emerging economies. Doing so is fraught with risks relating to academic oversight, integrity, freedom, and scholarship. These risks can be minimized and managed through sound institutional controls, through appropriate organizational structures, and strong academic administrators, such as those that we have at Holt International Business School. These mechanisms can be strengthened through clearer accreditation guidelines. Let me first elaborate. Well, what is the traditional model of business education? Well, typically, it is a unit of a larger university, perhaps a, a college or a school within the university. It's organized as a not-for-profit not, not entity, capitalized by the state, funded out of public revenues, sometimes supplemented by endowment funds, tuition revenues. It has an academic governance structure. Key decisions are made by faculty committees, the faculty senate. Contrast the commercial model of business education, typically a corporation organized as a for-profit entity, capitalized by private investors, 
funded primarily out of sales or tuition revenues with a corporate governance structure. That is, key decisions are made by the board of directors and by corporate managers. Understanding the commercial model requires a fundamental paradigm shift. Instead of looking at the student as a passive learner, let's look at the student as an active consumer. Instead of looking at a business school as an academic institution, let's look at it as a professional services firm. Instead of looking at education as a profession, let's look at it as a business. If you understand this paradigm, then you will grasp the essence of the commercial model, its rationale, why it has succeeded, its shortcomings, and the challenges it faces. The focal point of the commercial model is the educational demands of the consumer. What are these demands? Why do people go to business school? Typically, they go to business school to retool, to get new skills, to develop a professional network, to transition to a new job or a new career. Let's map out the consumer experience. <coughs> the consumer of educational services begins by researching pr prospective schools, usually through brochures that are available in the career library, through MBA fairs, online research. Next, the consumer applies for admission, one or several schools. After being accepted, the consumer enrolls in the program. Then, he or she relocates to the business school venue. Once at that venue, the consumer studies, learns, interacts with professors and with other students. Toward the end of his or her program, the student conducts a job search. After graduation, the student networks with employers, classmates, alumni. These consumer demands correspond to the functional areas of a business school. The school's marketing department provides information that can be discovered through student research. Its admissions office oversees the application process. The registry defines procedures for program registration and course enrollment. Its student services or student affairs assists with the relocation process. The Office of Academic Affairs oversees the quality of faculty. Career services assists with the job search and student placement. The Office of Alumni Affairs provides resources for networking. In what I call the traditional model, overseeing all these functions is the dean with centralized authority. Typically, the dean has strong academic credentials and extensive academic experience. Functional areas are the responsibility of other academics who all too often are promoted to administrative positions on the basis of outstanding research. Assuming a prominent role in governance are faculty committees who oversee content, curriculum, programs. <laughs> Organizationally, the traditional model is somewhat bureaucratic, hierarchical, and ordered by institutional rules and regulations. Now note, in the traditional model, the predominant institutional culture is academic, although there are subcultures such as marketing. In the academic culture, the work environment is collegial. The work style is individualistic. What attracts professionals to academia is an individual work style, 
They are master of the classroom. There is tremendous respect for prof professorial prerogatives in the classroom. What are the core values of this culture? Academic integrity, high academic standards, ideas, engagement, <coughs> academic freedom. What matters in the traditional model is process and procedure. Curriculum reform goes through the faculty committees. Academic rank, how often you have published and in what journals. Compliance with institutional rules and regulations, even if it takes months and even years to change something so simple as the title of a course. What also matters is individualism and academic freedom, as well as an environment that is conducive to both. In the context of globalization, what are the advantages of this model? Academic oversight, academic integrity, cohesiveness, common core values. The potential for culture class clash is minimized by the central authority of the dean, the appointment of academics to key administrative positions, the academic governance structure. What are the disadvantages? Scalability. Does the dean have sufficient bandwidth to lead a global expansion. Functional competencies. What do academic administrators know about construction and fit out in Mumbai? Does a tenured finance professor, now academic administrator, know about procuring an operating license in Guangzhou? Besides, is he or she impassioned by routine operational detail? Inefficiencies. If academic administrators are not competent in functional areas, now we have to hire competent assistant deans to support them. The assistant deans have functional expertise. Suddenly, the cost base has increased substantially. Supply-side program development. What the faculty want to teach is not necessarily what managers want to take. Inflexibility. The dean's proposal to reform the curriculum has been stuck in a faculty committee for months. The committee members have been engaged in a, in a debate over course titles. So why don't we let the academics do what they do best and what they have a passion for doing? Academics. And leave the rest to professional business managers. Why don't we adopt the commercial model? Of course, there are variations on these models. What I am projecting is a prototype. There are hybrid models. There are extremes. But this is a prototype of a commercial model. In this model, non-academic functions are decoupled from academic administrators and assigned to business managers. For example, <coughs> Operations is assigned to a senior operations manager, marketing to a senior marketing manager. All functions are subject to the authority of the chief executive officer, who is an experienced corporate executive, not necessarily an academic. 
what happens to academic affairs? Remember, this is a professional services firm. Because education is a service to be sold, <coughs> academic affairs falls under the authority of the vice president for services. In all likelihood, this official has been brought in from industry. His or her functional expertise is service operations, not necessarily academics. This model is highly market driven. Program design is shaped by market considerations, not by what the tenured faculty want to teach. It is based on this premise. MBA applicants with at least five years of business experience are big boys. They generally know what skills they need to earn a promotion or to make a career move. The role of the marketing team is to, deter to determine consumer preferences. It is to find out what skills and knowledge potential MBA applicants want and need. The marketing team conveys this information to the academic team, which designs a program that caters to consumer demand. The program is reviewed and approved by a faculty committee, thus providing a modicum of academic oversight. Once the program is approved, the academic team recruits qualified instructors to deliver the program, usually on short-term contract. It works with the operations team on facilities, infrastructure, and the mode of instructional delivery. Now, notice the potential for bottlenecks in the system. <coughs> Operationalizing the service takes 10 times the amount of time it takes to design a brochure. Alleviating these bottlenecks is the principal role of the vice president for services. Despite these bottlenecks, turnaround time is quick. Program design and delivery is facilitated by quick decision making, cross-functional teams, and an entrepreneurial spirit. The traditional model will have difficulty competing unless it reforms its system of academic governance, streamlines its administrative procedures, simplifies its rules and regulations, shifts its orientation from inward to outward, develops an effective marketing team and sales force. Alternatively, traditional business schools might be able to compete if they carve out key programs and resources, such as executive education, and incorporate them as a separate entity. In the context of globalized business education, what are the advantages of the commercial model? Functional competencies. Functional areas are managed by functional specialists. Efficiency. There is no need to hire an academic support staff of functional experts because the senior managers are themselves functional experts. <coughs> Scalability. Through a matrix, matrix organization and dual reporting lines, this structure can be replicated at a local campus level. <coughs> Thus, the school can go global. Demand-side program development. What managers want to take is what the company actually delivers. Flexibility, speed, agility. Because of its streamlined procedures, cross-functional teams, and fast turnaround, this organization can quickly exploit market opportunities. 
What are the disadvantages? Academic integrity. Let's look at this reporting line here. What is problematic about this reporting relationship? Does it impair the independent judgment of the academic? As a practical matter, does it result in the subordination of academic objectives to business objectives? Let's look at this reporting line here. What is problematic? Does it represent a conflict of interest? Is it wise to have the marketers who are paid on commission oversee admissions? There must be adequate controls in this model in order for it to work and to preserve academic integrity. The controls are in place at HALT. What is the predominant culture here? In the commercial model, the predominant culture is business with academic and marketing subcultures. Thus, the work environment is corporate, not necessarily collegial. The work style is based on teamwork as opposed to individual effort. What are the core values? Customer satisfaction. The customer is always right. Results, bottom line, fast decision-making, getting the job done, delivery, execution. Just as process and procedure are valued in the academic culture, so decision-making and results are valued in the business culture. And just as individual effort or individual freedom is valued in academia, so being a team player is valued in business. The concept of value. In a for-profit corporation, what is the principal mandate of management? To maximize shareholder value. Question. In the commercial model, what shareholder value is added by theoretical research, by referee journal articles, conference papers. What tangible investment returns do they generate for the shareholders? And how do they enhance the quality of services provided to the consumer? Academic oversight. Who should oversee academic affairs? A committee of distinguished professors or a team of competent business managers? With all due respect, have the business managers ever taught in the classroom? What should be the predominant standard for administering academic affairs? Should it be based upon a conception of the student as a learner or the student as a consumer? Should the appropriate standard in the classroom be the customer is always right? Employee status. In the commercial model, are deans corporate managers whose duty it is to execute business decisions? Or are they academic administrators expected to build a broad consensus among colleagues? And where do the faculty fit in? What is their status? They become corporate employees, perhaps at will, perhaps for a term of years, certainly not for life. This transformation has important implications for professorial prerogatives, academic freedom, scholarship. It represents a fundamental paradigm shift, a major transformation in collegial relationships. In terms of professorial prerogatives, does classroom space, time, and activity belong to the professor or to the corporation? 
If the professor is a corporate employee, can business managers dictate course content, learning objectives, cases, textbooks, the mode of delivery? Or do these things remain the prerogative of the professor? And to what extent should learning outcomes be subordinated to business objectives? Is the instructor an employee at will who delivers prepackaged services to the consumer on borrowed space and time? Academic freedom. If faculty contracts are short term, what happens to academic freedom? Does the prospect of retaliation through dismissal effectively chill free speech in the classroom? Does an instructor's duty of loyalty to the corporation supersede his or her right to free expression? Within the corporation, shouldn't academics be team players? Scholarship. To whom are scholarly ideas attributable? To the employee who generated them? To the employer who provides an environment conducive to the generation of ideas? Who owns the ideas? Do they belong to the community? Add to its pool of knowledge? and enhance its understanding of business? Or do they belong to the company, add to its intellectual property, and enhance its shareholder value? Can the corporation appropriate the ideas, productize them, and sell them in the market? If it owns if the company owns the means of online distribution, just like a publisher, doesn't it also have a stake in the ideas distributed? Let's go a step further. Can the company assert property rights in the design of courses, curricula, and programs? Can it register these copyrights with the appropriate governmental authorities? Can it prevent other business schools from adopting the same courses, curricula, and programs? These are some of the challenges associated with the commercial model. And let me emphasize, this is not HALT, because we have appropriate controls. We have recognized the challenges. We have strong deans and we have internal checks and balances. Other schools do not. How can these challenges be effectively addressed? Academic oversight. In my view, academics should be, substa academics should be substantially represented on the, the corporation's board of directors. They are substantially represented on our board of directors. <coughs> They should serve in an independent capacity, lest they risk compromising their independent judgment. In addition, there should be a separation of powers between the board and the faculty. These powers should be clearly delineated in the corporate charter or in a formalized pact between the board and the faculty. Academic integrity, clearly. <coughs> Admissions should fall under the authority of the academics, not the marketers. At Holt, admissions is overseen by the faculty. In addition, reporting relationships should not risk compromising the independent judgment of academic administrators, nor should they risk subordinating academic objectives to business objectives. Accreditation bodies should carefully scrutinize the impact of reporting relationships on academic decision making. Just like the legal bar, they should set forth guidelines, 
relating to the independence of a non-business professional within a business organization. Academic freedom. In the absence of the tenure system, all educational entities, private or public, should provide ironclad safeguards for academic freedom. Education authorities and accreditation bodies should see to it. The scope of academic freedom should be clearly defined. Undoubtedly, there are limits. Academic freedom was never intended to protect slander, defamation of character, inciting violence, and undermining the institutional basis of free speech. On the other hand, it was intended to protect political dissent and genuine disagreements over policies and procedures. Guarantees of academic freedom should be enshrined in the charter of every education corporation. Similar guarantees should be incorporated in the contracts of every education professional. Scholarship. In my view, scholarship is an integral part of business education. It sharpens teaching skills. It enhances the learning environment. It contributes to the community's pool of knowledge. By the same token, business scholarship by definition should be relevant to business. It should not merely characterize the obvious as a finding discoverable through empirical research. With this limitation, for-profit education institutions should be required to allocate a portion of their retained earnings to scholarly research. <clears throat> what about intellectual property? To whom do scholarly ideas belong? I propose that they belong to the scholar, the institution, and to society. All have some stake, some interest in the ideas. And so all should share in the wealth accruing from their commercialization. To summarize, commercializing business education can be an effective way to deliver educational services. By decoupling non-academic functions from academic administrators, by letting academics do what they do best, and what they have a passion for doing. Education corporations, what I have called the commercial model, can operate efficiently, can deliver effectively, generate economies of scale, cater to consumer demand. As I pointed out, however, decoupling the academic from the non-academic is fraught with risks. These risks can be minimized, they can be managed <coughs> through sound institutional controls, appropriate organizational structures, such as those that we have at Holt International Business School. More importantly, they can be minimized through the employment of strong academic administrators as those that we have at Holt. These internal mechanisms should be strengthened with clearer accreditation guidelines relating to the independence of academic administrators, academic representation on the board of directors, institutional safeguards for academic freedom, concurrent rights in intellectual property. After all, the duty to educate is owed not only to the corporation, but also to the student and to society. After all, in business education, the customer is not always right. Thank you very much. <laughs>